So thank you all for joining us for this talk entitled Neutral Neutrality Challenges and Solutions for Sustainable Development. As Andrew said, my name is Edwin Gazzelli and I'm a consultant hydrologist at WSP and I'm a committee member of SIREM's Southwestern Branch and presenting uh, alongside my colleague from WSP, James Edway. So our presentation will give you an overview of what Neutral Neutrality is, uh, why it's a, it's a hot topic right, right now within the sector. Uh, we're going to cover where Neutral Neutrality requirements uh, apply within the UK how to calculate nutrient neutrality and talk through what mitigation measures can be used to ensure that development, developments are uh, nutrient neutral. So to kick us off with a, a bit of context, I'm gonna pass over to my colleague, James. Thanks, Aidan. So I'm James Elloway, Technical Director in WSP's water team. And I've been delivering uh, nutrient neutrality assessments since 2018. Um, and early in my career, I was involved in uh, peripherally in the, in the development of the nutrient export coefficient modeling um, that, that now underpins this approach. So it's come full circle. Um, right, so nutrients are a big issue, a big big news item recently. Um, you can see here that the, the, the Guardian is, is saying that we're approaching phosphageddon. Essentially, we are importing nearly 200,000 tonnes a year of phosphorus rock from geopolitically unstable countries, including Russia and China. Um, that's becoming depleted um, and there's a risk that you know the agricultural sector that uh, relies on this phosphorus uh, rock um, you know yields could go down etc um, and at the same time we've got runoff of phosphorus into water bodies causing eutrophication and so you know there there seems to be an opportunity to close the loop by capturing phosphorus um, and recycling it rather than relying on mining and importing it. Meanwhile, in uh, Holland, uh, Dutch farmers are up in arms because you know, they're facing a nitrogeddon. Um, they've got the highest agricultural or livestock production in, the, in, in Europe. And uh, they, they have got lots of, uh, well, that's generating lots of um, emissions that is damaging European Union sort of habitat sites. And this has given rise to the what we know in the UK as the Dutch uh, nitrates case, um, where the uh, the habitats have to be protected. The government has committed to reducing um, emissions there, nitrogen emissions by fifty percent by twenty thirty, and to achieve that, they they're proposing to cut the livestock headcount by thirty three percent. So lots of farmers are understandably very concerned about their livelihoods and uh, are protesting um, and trying to get that overturned. They've also set up in 2018 a, a new political party um, for rural um, views, and that has, has recently become the largest single party in, in the parliament. Um, based on the last election just last month. So, you know, that's that's a political upheaval, really, um, and just shows the power and importance, I suppose, of the agricultural sector, but also the difficulties faced in, uh, you know, managing nitrogen and phosphorus pollution. In the UK, um, in contrast, we can see, uh, in, particularly in England, uh, we've got data here, the major sources of phosphorus in rivers come from um, wastewater treatment works. So, you know, existing housing load, plus a bit of industry and um, there's some septic tanks and package plants in there. 25% of the load comes from agriculture across England. And we'll, we'll have a look at how that uh, differentiates in some catchments in a minute, and then some diffuse load. So despite, you know, the majority of the phosphorus coming from wastewater treatment works. Until recently, there's been no plans um, to really tackle that from a nutrient neutrality perspective. Um, and agriculture, um, you know, seemingly has, has also, I suppose, had a slightly easier run of it, while housing developers um, seem to have borne the brunt for the last few years. Um, and they're responsible for about 0.5% of the total phosphorus load on an annual basis. Um, so, you know, they feel aggrieved, um, but there are plans in place and we'll touch on that in a minute now um, to address some of the other, the other sources of loads as well. Okay, thank you, Aidan. 
So going back to basics of what is nutrient neutrality. So in Natural England's words, nutrient neutrality is a means of ensuring that a development plan or project does not add to existing nutrient burdens or catchments. There's no net increase in nutrients as a result of the plan or project. But what are the existing nutrient burdens within catchments? What do we mean by that? So by nutrient burdens, we're referring to high levels of phosphorus and nitrogen within our catchments, uh, which are getting into rivers with deleterious effects, such as causing algal blooms, kind of as shown on the example on the screen. Uh, and we know that the River Y, which is uh, designated as a special area of conservation, is one of the rivers in the UK which experiences algal blooms, um, and that experiences algal blooms from uh, late spring through to early autumn. And if we look at the Y uh, as a bit of a, a case study, so the Y catchment, in recent years, I've uh, seen uh, an explosion in its, of intensive poultry farming uh, in Powell's in Herefordshire. And it's reported that there are now at least 20 million chickens in a catchment at any one time, uh, with the largest processor, processor dispatching uh, 2, billion, two, sorry, 2 million uh, birds a week, which is equivalent to effectively 104 million a year. And this represents effectively 9% of the 1.1 billion broilers produced in the UK each year. And the effect of having this many chickens uh, in, in the catchment is that the excess nutrients generated by these chickens, which is spread on a farm, sorry, on farmland as fertilizer, uh, has been identified as a major contributor of riverine nutrient increases that are driving a deterioration in water quality in the Y catchment, which, was, which is why it's generating uh, large uh, algal blooms and damaging the river ecology. And the uh, umbrella organization for the Welsh Rivers Trust, Afonio Kimberley, uh, estimates that 72% of nutrients in the Y catchment are coming from agriculture, with 23% um, from wastewater treatment works. And while these uh, values may not be generally applicable uh, to those of other English river catchments, which we know are, are more urban, they do demonstrate that certainly in some catchments, um, effectively house developers may be kind of being held responsible for, you know, uh, cleaning up and kind of dealing with the nutrient neutrality issue when actually it might be the agricultural sector which is, is primarily responsible for these high nutrient loads um, and in more urban catchments it's the existing houses which are generating the bulk of the loads um, as opposed to the uh, new new houses. So there's also uh, nutrient problems in, in UK estuaries. Um, tidal mudflats are important feeding grounds for, for wading birds and underpin designations um, of, of sites such as Paul Harbour as, as a Ramsar site. And the issue with this is, you know, if, if you've got algal uh, blooms on, on, on tidal mudflats, it's the smothering of these mudflats prevents waders from, from feeding, reducing the resources available to them and potentially reducing the population size of important vulnerable bird species. So it's targeting what is uh, designating these sites as, you know, SACs or, or Ramsar sites with the, the effects of the uh, nutrient pollution. Moving on to what is being done about it. So, in England, through Natural England and Wales, through uh, Natural Resources Wales, uh, they've both imposed uh, nitrogen and or phosphorus neutrality requirements uh, on new developments containing overnight accommodation uh, in catchments with habitats that are in unfavourable conditions because of uh, nitrate or phosphorus and or both. Uh, so Natural England's March 22 guidance uh, also did allow for the inclusion of other development projects, uh, including industrial and agricultural, to be subject to nutrient neutrality requirements if they could have a nutrient impact in affected catchments. So the affected catchments are uh, habitat sites which are designated as uh, special areas of conservation, so SACs, special protection areas, SPAs uh, and Ramsar sites. Uh, the SACs tend to be typically freshwater, the SPAs are typically uh, estuarine and or coastal environments, and the Ramsar sites uh, can be a mixture of, of both. I'm just going to now move on to kind of where these apply and you can see uh, a map on screen. So your left-hand side is uh, these areas across England where the, the, the nutrient neutrality catchments are, and you can see on the right-hand side, uh, those in Wales. So nutrient neutrality requirements apply to 27 catchments, uh, affecting 72 local authorities in England. Uh, and of the, 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 make, the makeup of these, there are three uh, catchments uh, where it's just nitrogen requirements applying, and these are effectively uh, estuarine and coastal ones. There's nine catchments where it's nitrogen and phosphorus requirements, and 15 uh, for phosphorus only. Uh, in Wales, there are five river catchments. Uh, the Y, Ask, Kledu, Taifi, and D. Apologies if I've mispronounced any of, of those. Uh, and there is uh, Loch Leven uh, in Scotland, uh, which is the only catchment at the moment in Scotland where there are nutrient uh, neutrality requirements in place. So what are the challenges that nutrient neutrality uh, is posing? James. 
Great, thanks, Aidan. <clears throat> so the um, achieving nutrient neutrality for housing development is both uh, time consuming and costly. Um, and this requirement has, has introduced a lot of uncertainty into the planning process. And so you know, that's resulted in very significant uh, challenges for housing developers to, uh, to resolve. Um, and as you can see here, you know, there's lots of uh, trade press about the impact of this. Um, you know, there's reports of it pushing up the price of land, for example, that stopped the delivery of 120,000 homes across those affected catchments. Um, and, you know, that's having a knock on impact on affordable home delivery as well. So significant problems, lots of cost and time associated with resolving these issues. And also significant unintended consequence um, where agricultural land is being used um, and converted to low nutrient um, land uses to provide mitigation for, for housing development sites. You know, and that's despite the UK being less than 50% self-sufficient in food already. So, um, you know, no doubt some farmers are doing quite well out of it, but there are significant issues there um, in terms of housing supply, um, and and economics um, as well. So the uh, the government has um, considered what to do, um, and it is coming up with the uh, leveling up and regeneration bill or LERB. Now within that, there's a statutory requirement for water companies to upgrade their larger wastewater treatment works to achieve what's called technically achievable limits or TAL. Um, and that's a discharge concentration of 0.25 milligrams a litre for total phosphorus and 10 milligrams per litre for total nitrogen. Um, and, you know, that's quite a hard ask. Um, many, many works don't have permit conditions at all. Um, they've also tasked Natural England with uh, developing an accelerator unit to deliver mitigation credits by uh, promoting mitigation schemes. Um, and that's been up and running for just about a year now, uh, and they just opened the first mitigation scheme for applications late last month. So that's the T's catchment for nitrogen mitigation. So that's a, that's a really creditable turnaround. Um, and they are looking at other catchments as well. I suspect that they will be slower to come to market because they're more likely to need um, you know, constructed wetlands to mitigate the phosphorus load in, in the other sort of mostly freshwater catchments. And LERB also means that the local planning authorities can rely on those wastewater treatment works upgrades by 2030, once LERB comes into force. So, you know, that's aimed at trying to provide a bit more certainty um, back into the planning process. However, um, you know, there, there is um, some degree, I suppose, of, um, uh, challenge around what that means. If you could skip to the next slide, Aidan, please. Thanks. So TAL on its own may not be low enough to actually deliver nutrient neutrality for all sites without further mitigation, whether that's on or off site. Um, and we're looking at sites where even going lower than TAL won't you know, allow a site to wash its face, essentially. So it might not be the silver bullet that, that people hope it might be, but hopefully it provides enough, um, you know, enough mitigation for, um, for, for most sites. And also our understanding is that um, nutrient headroom, that TAL, achieving TAL um, will generate, won't be available to help mitigate new developments. And our understanding is that that is uh, under consideration in Wales um, and NRW and, and uh, Welsh Water are discussing that. So that might be helpful where there are really difficult schemes um, that can't be mitigated or achieved just through, uh, through the application of TAL. I think it's fair to say as well that there's a fair degree of scepticism that all of the affected wastewater treatment works will, will be upgraded in that time frame. You know, that's just one and a bit amp cycles. Uh, it's hundreds of millions, probably uh, into the billions of wastewater treatment works upgrades. And I think that, you know, the water companies are facing very significant challenges there to be able to deliver that. Um, and, and privately, um, you know, we're, we understand that they think that's going to be very difficult. 
one of the other issues is that developers you know need mitigation solutions now um, and can't wait until 2030 if they're building a, a, a big strategic scheme and it's early in the planning stage that's probably okay um, but the developers that are at construction now you know, need some solutions now and if, if if there's no commercially available mitigation scheme in their catchment and natural England doesn't have one but, you know there are lots of schemes that are are being completely held up um, and it's also worth noting as well that the um, you know the tal is is probably not as low as you can already get for non-site wastewater treatment works so there are trials going on to establish uh, an on-site wastewater treatment works achieving 0.1 milligrams per litre total phosphorus, um, which will be a game changer. And they can already achieve uh, five milligrams a litre for total nitrogen. So, you know, clearly there's a cost benefit analysis there, um, the level of effort put in to achieve it. But I think developers, if they have a suitably sized um, scheme, have the option of putting an on-site wastewater treatment works in now as a solution. Great. So, uh, Aidan, over to you for solutions. Great, thank you, James. So, before needing to consider what mitigation measures uh, can be in place, um, it's important to, to think about uh, how you can optimize uh, nutrient loads when kind of calculating, um, yeah, nutrient neutrality for a development. Um, and as the cost of mitigation uh, can be high, and achieving neutrality can be very difficult, particularly for, for phosphorus. Yeah, this is a very important step to, to, to take to see how you can kind of optimize uh, yeah, those, those calculations compared to the uh, natural England defaults. Uh, and optimization of these, these calculations just focus on as many of the key input elements uh, as possible um, and take a robust approach. Um, and any variations will require uh, detailed justification. We know that from experience, Natural England has uh, accepted the use of uh, alternate occupancy rates to compare to their uh, default occupancy rate of, uh, of, of 2.4. Um, so you can calculate locally specific rates for each development, um, and this may require socioeconomic assessment uh, and will require support of the relevant LPA. You can also look to reduce the default water usage. Um, this is possible uh, potentially through grey water or even black water recycling. Uh, but it will come at cost uh, and might not be highly palatable to prospective home buyers. Uh, and any scheme would need to be secured in perpetuity, so likely to require a centralized system rather than uh, individually property, individual property level systems that may be more readily decommissioned. We note that Natural England's method uh, requires that every wastewater treatment work load calculation be based on the wastewater treatment work operating at 90% of its discharge permit limit, uh, if there is one. Um, however, there is evidence that some wastewater treatment works um, are operated at much better levels than this. For example, we know that the Fording Ridge wastewater treatment work in the Hampshire Raven catchment has a 10 year TP discharge concentration of 0.53 milligrams a litre against a permit discharge of one milligram a litre. So in this case, the use of a the, the use of the 9% rule therefore would generate a 70% overestimation of the foul phosphorus load uh, from any development discharging to this wastewater treatment work. And that's a foul nutrient load is typically you know, the largest component. This is it's a very significant issue. Um, and if sufficient evidence is available to demonstrate that a long-term improved and stable performance at, uh, at a wastewater treatment work, it would be sensible to discuss with Natural England on a case-by-case on a -case basis. Um, however, we're not yet aware of a situation where this has been challenged successfully. Another area in the uh, calculations that can be optimized uh, is uh, the percentages impairable errors. So the default calculation method assumes that the impairable error of the housing component of a new development is 80% regarding uh, TP and 100% for uh, TN titan nitrogen. In contrast, uh, successful drainage strategies developed for schemes often indicate that uh, a print value is around 45 to 50% uh, and then with a 10% allowance for, for urban creep. And uh, this can help reduce the, the surface or nutrient load generated by a site, uh, generated by the site. And we know that Natural England has accepted this approach of site specific pimp values. Um, and when considering each of these kind of individual uh, methods or elements that can be uh, optimized within the, the load calculation, it's important uh, to, to do this because there's a 20% uh, precautionary buffer um, applied uh, on, on top as, as part of the Natural England method um, but otherwise it's you know a very conservative method with then 20% applied on top um, 
and when you can consider all of these potential kind of refinements or optimizations to, to the method uh, as an example, um, we know that for a say a 600 home development in the in a T's catchment, where there was a requirement for nitrogen neutrality, uh, based on the default uh, natural England method calculation, that would generate a nitrogen load of just over 1,700 uh, kilograms a year. However, uh, it's able to be reduced to just a fraction of that, at just 85 kilograms a year, using uh, the approved local occupancy rate of 0.8 uh, per unit, and the site specific pimp value of 45 percent. Uh, in this case, it's the occupancy rate being so uh, reduced so much uh, that did the uh, heavy heavy lifting effectively. This is typically one of the most uh, important uh, criteria to to review and look to optimize. However, um, optimization of of the uh, neutral neutrality calculations isn't going to kind of get every site to the point where it is it is neutral. So it, you often will be residual loads of of total nitrogen and phosphorus, which which needs to be mitigated. Um, and when it comes to mitigation, natural England's uh, principles mean that mitigation must be highly targeted to the development and the wastewater treatment works location. Uh, although in some catchments, um, it is possible to mitigate at, sorry, uh, at a lower point in the catchment, uh, as is the case of the T's and some of the developments uh, in the Solent region. Uh, mitigation measures need to be secured in perpetuity and uh, delivered prior to first occupations. And we're now going to run you through what a few mitigation measures can be. So first of all, we're going to talk about on-site wastewater treatment works, which James has briefly already mentioned. So an on-site wastewater treatment work can deliver discharge percent limits uh, of 0.25 milligrams for total phosphorus and 5 milligrams for total nitrogen. At the moment, that's already there, that's already proven. And this is a good option for larger developments, say circa 200 houses or higher, that can afford the cost of these and need a solution now rather than waiting for, for TAL to be, be in place by 2030. A treatment process designer is currently running a demonstration trial to establish if these systems can achieve an even lower uh, total phosphorus uh, uh, discharge of uh, 0.1 milligrams a litre. And if that does happen, that could potentially be a massive game changer for this. Um, for the kind of in terms of uh, prices of, of these systems, a smaller system of, say, 180 homes uh, could cost in the region of 1.25 million um, plus a commuted sum of another half a million. Larger systems for say up to 1800 units might be looking at a cost of approximately uh, five and a quarter million. And the operating costs uh, for these would be funded through sewage charges to the property owners. There are of course challenges with having an on-site uh, on wastewater treatment work, uh, which include identifying a suitable discharge uh, location and associated pipeline rate. Uh, you need to consider the site footprint and odor buffer, which which, reduces, which would reduce the site housing yield uh, and obtain uh, a discharge uh, location approval and discharge consent. So that'd be from the environment agency in, in England or from natural resources, Wales, uh, if the site was in, in, in Wales. In addition to the more traditional on-site wastewater treatment works, there is the also option of botanical uh, wastewater treatment works. And uh, this is the image on screen shows an uh, example of the Organica Botanical Wastewater Treatment Works, um, and this provides potentially an interesting option for larger high-end developments that may not require the ultra-low discharge consent limits to by more traditional wastewater treatment works. The Organica systems can achieve discharge consent limits of 0.2 milligrams a litre for total phosphorus and 10 milligrams uh, a litre for total nitrogen. However, they are more expensive, so therefore are better suited to, to larger sites which offer economies of scale. Um, these sort of systems cost in the region of 2.5 million for a thousand home scheme, rising up to three and a half million for a three and a half thousand unit scheme. Um, although these costs only cost discussed for the uh, traditional uh, on site waste which were kind of taken kind of before kind of recent uh, spikes in, in inflation. Um, Challenges for a botanical wastewater treatment work would be similar to those for the more traditional type in terms of, you know, needing to uh, sort out a discharge location uh, and permitting that need to be agreed with the, the same uh, relevant statutory authorities, so uh, EA, NRW, uh, etc. Moving away from kind of larger scale to potentially smaller scale uh, and packaged treatment plants. So a Natural England uh, report sampled a range of package treatment plant discharges uh, and calculated uh, a mean discharge concentration of 15.1 milligrams a litre total phosphorus, um, which is actually considered higher than that achieved even by wastewater treatment works that do not have a total phosphorus discharge permit, which are usually uh, in the range of uh, eight to five uh, milligrams a litre. 
However, uh, in rural areas where it's not possible to connect to a wastewater treatment works or for isolated individual or groups of small properties, the use of a package treatment plant that is optimised for nutrient reduction may be beneficial. So Clagister, who uh, one of the suppliers for this type of system, claimed that their airflow system combined with their force tank uh, can treat to just two milligrams a litre total phosphorus, uh, and that's uh, using ferric uh, chloride dosing. Um, however, we have tended to work on larger sites, don't have direct experience um, of, of, of package treatment plants, um, but this is perhaps something which could be uh, picked up in a QA. and um, I'm now going to hand back over to, to James to talk you through a few of the other types of solutions. Great, thanks Aidan. Um, so treatment wetlands are a good option, particularly for sites that need to achieve phosphorus neutrality, which as we've discussed is really difficult and, and almost practically impossible to achieve through conversion of agricultural land. Um, you know, wetland obviously requires a water source and the, uh, you know, the, the better water sources are those that are more constant um, and also that have a higher nutrient concentration and the size of the wetland will be intrinsically linked to that sort of circularity. Um, so you know, a river uh, with relatively low phosphorus concentrations will require a larger footprint for wetland. And conversely, if you were to, um, to have access to treated effluent from a wastewater treatment works, it's got a good constant flow um, and it's got higher concentrations of phosphorus and nitrogen, which means you can have a a really effective uh, wetland on a smaller footprint. Clearly, they're not uh, going to be particularly cheap, um, but as I, as I said, you know, in phosphorus catchments, they, they can be really quite effective. Um, they can be, uh, you know, incorporate reactive filter media in them to try and boost the phosphorus adsorption. And there's an arm FOSS system developed by Arm Limited uh, that, that uh, works with those or sells those systems. So key considerations obviously include land next to a water source, um, ground conditions, um, and topography, uh, landscape and visual as well. And where possible, uh, you know, if these can be designed to be integrated into the uh, land form rather than being traditional plan form wetlands. There's also the benefit here of, of um, having BNG stacking. So that's been a recent development. So that, that's a great opportunity uh, to get some good BNG into a scheme as well. Um, and thankfully, um, there's some guidance being issued by Natural England on what they expect a wetland design to look like. And you can see there on the right hand side, they've provided a matrix showing um, how much of the calculated nutrient removal from a wetland can be claimed as a benefit to mitigate a scheme based on their confidence in the design, um, the maintenance, the, the flow, and also the concentration data. So, you know, if you've got a really high quality design, um, you've really characterized the, the, you know, the influent flow and concentration data, for example, from a treated uh, uh, effluent stream, then you can claim up to 100% of the benefit. But as soon as the confidence drops, uh, then so does the uh, percentage that you can claim. So it's really important to have high quality design and really good underpinning data for that as well. So SUDs are um, also very important. These are clearly used on sites already for um, volume control and flow control. But it's more important now than ever that they're also um, specified to manage nitrogen and phosphorus uh, as well. Um, and you know, it, it's a really sensible idea to have a really good treatment train with source controls, area and regional controls. So controlling and reducing as much phosphorus and nitrogen as possible. And clearly the, uh, the greener options will be better than hard engineered, which, which don't remove nutrients. At all. So you're looking there at green roofs, you know, vegetated swales. Um, I, I love that rain garden. Um, my SUDS colleagues uh, will no doubt be really pleased to see that that's all they need to do uh, for their design process. Um, and ponds, ponds are really good detention basins and retention basins, uh, also pretty good. So it's important that we, uh, we can um, 
take as much nutrients out of the surface water component of the load calculations. Syria has recently published this guidance document, um, which is really good because it was a bit of a wild west out there for the last few years. Um, they were saying that Natural England was saying we couldn't use um, previous SUDS guidance. People were using stuff from Minnesota and, and all over the place. So this is set out quite clearly what, what Natural England, I think, expects to see. And you can see there that, um, you know, there's a range of SUDS features um, with different capturing abilities at, at sediment, so phosphorus uh, abound to sediment and dissolved phosphorus. And so the idea is that you'd have a mix of all of those targeting um, as much of the phosphorus removal as possible. Um, and it can be additive as well. Um, so you can get some really good removal rates overall. Um, so you can see there the willow beds, uh, fantastic, 100% phosphorus removal. And the guidance also provides um, some details on un the circumstances under which you can claim 100% phosphorus removal from infiltration, you know, including depth to groundwater. So where that's possible, um, you know, th th that's now um, a really good opportunity. Ni nitrogen removal through SUDS um, guidance document is expected later this year, uh, and that will be very helpful as well. So moving on, uh, some developers are uh, able to mitigate their sites by using agricultural land conversion. So targeting land uses that have the highest nutrient impacts. So you know, that's maybe dairy, piggeries, and arable and converting them to low nutrient land uses like woodland, uh, wetlands, and conservation meadows. And many of the nitrogen mitigation schemes that are commercially available are based on this principle. Um, but it's also possible for a developer to do it themselves if they have some spare land or, or wish to buy some, uh, but not effective for phosphorus. And then there may be other offsite um, interventions. So looking at catchment uh, options, it, it might be the construction of integrated uh, constructed wetlands for a farm or a series of farms in the catchment. Alternatively, if there are um, land uses in the catchment that have a high phosphorus export rate, such as fish farms and watercress farms, it's possible to um, purchase those and close them down and claim the phosphorus or nitrogen uh, benefit from that. And indeed, one of my former clients has, has done that and um, bought a fish farm. And I understand that they're selling a, a kilogram of phosphorus for 75,000 pounds, which is uh, it's quite remarkable and shows you know, how difficult it is to achieve phosphorus neutrality. So uh, I mentioned reactive filter media earlier as being you know, an, an addition to a wetland, um, but there is the intriguing possibility that they can be used as an add-on to polish treated effluent um, that's maybe gone through a package treatment plant or a septic tank um, or other process. And there's a couple of manufacturers um, here, so Polonite and Foslock. Um, Polonite claims that their approach can bind up to 100% of the available phosphorus and that it can treat influent concentrations of 5 to 20 milligrams per litre down to as low as 0.1 to 0.3. Um, and they don't specify a dwell time. Now, you know, we haven't verified that, but if, if that's true, uh, certainly a really interesting opportunity. Um, and potentially that material can then be taken out of the catchment once it's saturated and used uh, as a soil conditioner um, and, and possibly, you know, a, a slow release sort of fertilizer as well. And Foslock claim something similar. So while we've, we've suggested these to clients, they're seen as novel and, and sort of uncertain. So nobody's yet taken us up on these uh, options, but it, it may pour, uh, form you know, a useful strategy. Water efficiency retrofitting has been accepted by Natural England as a uh, mitigation um, if applied to properties that are under the control of an organization such as a local authority or a housing association. So not for private dwellings because of the risk that they'll be stripped out. Um, the measures have to be um, plumbed into the fabric of the property 
otherwise they are deemed to be too easily removed and that wouldn't meet the practical and uh, certainty of delivery and in perpetuity either. So this example here, the Synergist uh, HL2024, um, has been accepted by Natural England to provide a 27 litre per person per day reduction uh, in water consumption for properties built prior to 2010. And where you, where you have uh, such properties in a portfolio, um, you need to retrofit roughly four and a half homes to uh, mitigate one new home. So certainly that's something really interesting to look at. And although that has been accepted by Natural England uh, for a development in Somerset, I've just seen a letter where they now object to that approach uh, at a second site. So um, we're, we're waiting to see quite uh, what, what that means. And finally, if there is um, a commercial or a Natural England credit scheme in, in the catchment, then that may be a very good approach, um, depending on the cost benefit of it. Certainly less risky than building a wastewater treatment works or a wetland, um, but may not necessarily be a lot cheaper. So there's um, credits available, um, the T's catchment, from uh, Natural England's mitigation scheme has, has reduced the price to £1,825 for a kilogram, but typically they're around about 3500 for a kilogram of nitrogen and phosphorus considerably higher because of the, the complexity in uh, providing that mitigation. And you can see there in the left uh, left hand side, Natural England has assessed the catchments and identified those with high, medium and low housing pressures. So. Uh, you know, you can expect to see mitigation uh, schemes coming forward in, in the high housing pressure catchments um, in due course. So that's a quick trot through some of the solutions. Um, uh, we'll have a quick look now at uh, an example. So this is, this is a scheme we've been working on for quite some time now. The, the schemes are around about 4,000 homes. We've applied the um, Natural England calculation method, 2.4 people per unit. Uh, it's a large site, as you would expect, and it's 50% open space. And you can see the nutrient load there was very highly positive, you know, 600 kilograms a year of phosphorus and over 7,000 for nitrogen. And so if you looked at uh, the mitigation options we've just discussed, you'd need 15,000 hectares of arable land conversion which is clearly not going to happen. Mitigation credits are not available in that catchment yet. And a wetland, um, you know, really quite sizable um, and no land within the, uh, the available land holdings of the client. So we looked at optimizing the nutrient load. Um, thankfully, it's in the broads catchment. So the 1.89 uh, people per unit occupancy rate can be applied. Um, We've reduced the water consumption to 110 litres per person per day as per the local authorities calculator. We have assumed uh, a 50% removal of nitrogen through the uh, nitrogen and phosphorus through the suds. And we're investigating now whether that can be 100% through infiltration. We've reduced the PIMP and we have planned for an on site wastewater treatment works with cutting edge uh, discharge consent limits. And also there was a little gap to bridge. So taking the foul flows from 125 adjacent existing houses and connecting those into that wastewater stream works to get that extra benefit. And that tips the site just into neutrality. So it's, it's a lot of work um, and there's a lot of cost there, obviously uh, a large wastewater treatment works, for example, to, to achieve that, but it can be done. Um, and I think it shows the value of um, optimizing the calculations before you then move into the mitigation stage um, to reduce costs overall. So just to summarize then, uh, nutrient neutrality is, is uh, difficult, it's costly, it's time consuming, all of that. Um, it requires an experienced multidisciplinary team. So, you know, that would include SUDS, landscape, ecology, BNG, obviously all the water and water engineering side of things. And then if you're putting in a, an on-site wastewater treatment works, that'll trigger air quality and odor and noise potentially, plus planning and permitting. So it really does need a cohesive team to deliver high quality effective schemes. And if you're designing a wetland, clearly biology, uh, 
ecology, biodiversity, BNG, um, and landscape are, are going to be fundamental to that as well. It's really important to get this team involved early because the master plan will change based on the outcomes of the assessment. Um, and as we've said, mitigate, um, you know, only look at mitigation once the load calculation has been optimized. So, you know, in summary, um, early professional advice uh, is, is good value for money because it, uh, it, it helps to smooth the passage through the planning process uh, and ensure that the master plan is um, designed to help minimize the nutrient load from the development. Okay. And uh, so, yes, thank you very much for your time. And thanks, Siwen, for the opportunity to uh, just to speak to you today. Fantastic. Nice one, James and Aidan. Really, really interesting. And it's been that interesting. We've got uh, 20 questions Ooh. lined up specially for you. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to go straight into those um, so that we uh, can keep on our hours schedule for another 11 minutes. So they'll be fairly quick fire. Uh, nutrient neutrality is a good way of protecting green space from the threat of large identical housing developers. Discuss. Well, that's great. Um, Barbara would like to answer this question live, apparently. Go for it, Barbara. No, I'm just popping, getting it ready to, for you to answer. Oh, I see. <laughs> Okie dokie. <laughs> In that case, go for it, James and Adrian. Um, um, right, okay, we'll that's, quite a large, long. that's quite a large topic, isn't it? And I don't think it is. Got, that's the problem. I don't and think we've got to have time to touch on it Alex in detail. But, but, you know, I don't know that it's necessarily going to change how the houses are designed and delivered, but certainly I think, you know, maximization of green space is really important. And with biodiversity net gain as well, um, you know, that's gonna double up. So um, yeah, I, th I think it is a good thing for that. The impact that spatially it'll have on, on master plans for developments is a good thing. So uh, uh, when does LURB come into force, asks uh, somebody else. Um, it will come into force when it's finished, it's uh, wending its way through Parliament. So it's currently, I think, in committee stage, um, possibly next year. I don't know. Um, I think it's a case of watching this space. Okie dokie. How will local planning authorities enforce or police land use change as mitigation? So they will require that to be a planning condition and that there will be a covenant over the land which includes monitoring. Um, so, you know, if, if there's land conversion to woodland, there needs to be a woodland management plan developed showing, you know, what species, how it's going to be established, what monitoring is required in the first six years, what then after it's been established. Um, and that's, that's going to have to be, you know, costed and, and included in, in the developer. And then I guess delivered by whoever's, whoever's doing the landscape visual, uh, the landscape, delivery for, for new schemes. Helena asks, what level of reduction of nutrients could be achieved by eliminating spills of raw sewage into rivers? That's a really topical question. Um, the answer is I don't know because, well, I'd need to do some research on that, but I suspect it's it's a reasonable amount. Um, we saw earlier that it's, you know, total loads to, to rivers in England are 60 to 70 percent from sewage. I don't know the component of that that's raw. Um, clearly, we've got a lot of sewage being treated and going into the rivers 24-7. Um, so how the raw element of that from CSO's accounts, I don't know. But a really interesting question. If anybody's got the answer, please let us know. Yes. And obviously, are we, pre are we prepared to pay for it as a, uh, as a nation? And I guess we should, but uh, yep. Okay. Is LURB applicable to all sites greater than 2000 PE or just where there is a positive nutrient load to the catchment? Hello. Any ideas? Um, sorry, I just lost you there. I think. Um, oh, right. Can you hear me? Yep, I can yep. hear you. Maybe it's my connection. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm getting a message. My internet connection is on, so it must mean the kids are home. Um, right. Is LURB applicable? LURB is applicable to um, all wastewater treatment works that have a treatment 
capacity of over 2000 population equivalent. Um, so, so that's what it's designed for. LERB will more generally apply to all nutrient neutrality catchments. And most of them will have some larger wastewater treatment works than that. So there's an issue there where smaller, more rural populations and communities may not get the mitigation um, they need because their wastewater treatment works is too small. Too small. So that's, yeah. that's a bit of an issue. Okay. How realistic is limiting water use in new developments to 80 litres per person per day? Um, it's achievable. Um, Cambridge at the moment is telling new developers that they've only got 80 litres per person per day. Um, so they're going to have to comply with that because they've got shortage. I think this is coming down the track at us. Um, Grey water recycling can get you down to that. Black water can get you down, I think, to around 65 litres per person per day. But clearly, you know, there's palatability issues there, as Aidan mentioned. And home builders don't typically like to go below 110 because they don't think that their customers are going to be, you know, keen to buy their houses. And it's obviously a highly competitive market. So there might need to be, um, you know, some um, some government requirement that this happens. So there's a level playing field before any one developer will move. Speaking from a per personal perspective, uh, looking at my water bill, my water bill, and I've, you know, I've got a family, uh, and we are we are down to 75 liters uh, per person per day uh, i don't i don't see that it's a a huge huge problem personally i think if uh, um yeah i think i think more more can be done on um on water saving and reuse personally <laughs> but yep. um okay let's move on would it not be beneficial to add exact fertilizer usage using farm scoper to gain the existing P load? Um, it might be. I mean, there's there's a degree of complexity towards doing that, I suppose. And Natural England's method has used farm scoper to generate the phosphorus and nitrogen export coefficients from each land use. So I think it's got better because there was previously just one number for arable for a whole catchment. Um, and the latest iteration now looks at it, um, you know, with much more granularity, but, but it's certainly something that could be looked at. Okay. We've had no luck with reducing occupancy rates or default water usage with natural England ecologist in the Teesmouth catchment. That's really a statement, not a question. Yeah, so that's interesting. Um, so the, it, it depends which local authority you're in, I think. So Darlington Borough Council have accepted 0.8 as an occupancy rate. Um, if you're in the Teesmouth catchment, but outside Darlington Borough Council, then you might not have the same occupancy rate. Um, and it does vary. You know, I mentioned earlier that Natural England seemingly had accepted water efficiency retrofit. And, and today we've had a letter saying um, no. So uh, it varies across the country. I think yes, keep, I, I keep guess it's a moving, on. yeah, keep pressing and it's yeah. a it's a it's a moving target. Um, Kevin asks, the nutrient calculations use an occupancy of 2.4 or lower in some areas. Why doesn't the calculation use a worst case scenario such as used in flows and loads, max occupancy? Um, right. I mean, it was a decision taken by Natural England to use the national average, you know, which is essentially number of people divided by number of homes. Um, which is already conservative, as, as we've discussed. So as you can see, there's quite a lot of evidence out there that site specific numbers are actually a lot lower um, than 2.4. So you know, I think it is already rather conservative. And as we've discussed, there are levels of conservatism and then they're multiplied one by the and other. And go on, yes, they and add to it. And then 20% precautionary buffer added. So I think there's sufficient conservatism already. Emma asks a question. Given the phosphorus loads in domestic wastewater, are there any planned advocacy education pieces aimed at customers or consumers to reduce the loads they contribute to the wastewater network? Uh, I can't answer that. That would be um, something I suppose that the water companies would need to do. And certainly they do have schemes to 
um, to educate their customers about this. And they've also got water efficiency retrofit schemes as well. Um, that they go out and, and actively try and reduce water usage in their in their patches. So um, whether that answers your question, I'm not quite sure. Hopefully it does. Sarah asks, what does point of impact mean? So typically that would be the wastewater treatment works discharge point. So okay. that's where the majority of the load is going to go out. Okay, another anonymous one. If an on-site wastewater treatment works is used as mitigation, then who owns it? Is it handed over to the local WASC or is it considered private? Um, it could be uh, either or. So we, we do a lot of work with um, new appointment and variation companies like Seven Drink Connect, for example, who would be a private owner and maintainer of it but they would they would be um accepted as a buy off what as the undertaker um, there is a process for that so they would be an official wastewater treatment works provider or it could be adopted by you know the local uh local water company and you know we're in discussions with several about doing just that would that be conditioned presumably uh yes it would yeah i think so uh, somebody else asks, I have just specified a Clargest, a treatment plant on a small barn conversion to deal with phosphates, and this was not accepted by the local planning authority. That, that's interesting. Um, as I said, we don't have experience of working with um, many smaller schemes that would require this, but that's interesting feedback. So, so thank you, Anonymous uh, and Paul. Um, it's, it's something that you know, obviously would, would need approval. Um, and there may be other systems out there that uh, may provide something beneficial, but obviously you've got to get to neutrality. Yeah. I've got one in my house. So uh, it has obviously uh, been approved previously. Um, Helena asks, how long does a wetland have to be operational before it can be accepted as mitigation? Yeah, great question. So, um, as I touched on, you know, it's a biological system. You know, engineers can run their slide rule over such a system and design it, but it doesn't necessarily perform always as expected. Um, so, I would anticipate that there's going to be 12 to 24 months of post commissioning monitoring monthly um, for Natural England to be confident that the, uh, the wetland is performing as. Uh, as specified and you'd have a maintenance and management plan for that wouldn't you? yeah uh, ba -ba 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 i think we've already answered that question next one could developers use novel approaches to mitigate or does it need to be one of those defined by natural england for example changing relevant slash nearby agriculture to fertilizers with lower nutrients yes um I'm, I'm all for exploring novel uh, solutions. And, you know, Natural England doesn't, it doesn't really necessarily specify what you can and can't do. Um, so I think they're open to having that discussion. But I guess the more novel and innovative it becomes, the harder it's likely to get approved uh, and more justification you need and, and, and more evidence. But, but certainly, um, you know, if you look in the Pearl Harbor catchment, Environment Agency, Natural England and um, Wessex Water have got a big scheme there to, to really push down on nutrient usage um, to get it really low because Pearl Harbor is, uh, you know, in, in quite a poor condition. So it is a sort of approach that would be, I, I would have thought, embraced if you could do it at sufficient scale. And with, with evidence. Good. Yeah. Lorraine asked, did you say one seller sold one kilogram of phosphorus for £75,000? It's better yes. than fish farming, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Um, it it's quite an extraordinary number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. You, you mentioned earlier recycling. Mm. Where, where's the recycling? How can I, how can I do it? If I've got, if I've got some uh, a catchment with a bit of phosphorus in it, how can I extract that 75,000? Well, do you give yeah, I mean, you could potentially land? do that through, through a wetland. Um, you know, the phosphorus that comes out will go into the vegetation and the soils, which will need to be renewed eventually. Um, it's possible that, you know, that could be used as a soil conditioner and, and um, resold to a certain extent. I mentioned the example of the reactive filter media. 
Um, you know, this this is a Maybe. bit of an issue. There's there's yeah. um, sewage treatment works. You know, biosolids as well. Obviously, stuff full of phosphorus and nitrogen. And I know that you know, this is a big water industry challenge. It's how do you how do you close that loop? Because it's nonsensical to keep importing it whilst flushing it into the rivers and and causing an ecological issue. Um, you know, there's got to be a better way. Innovation. Let's yeah, all, and, and better treatment. Yeah, yeah, is is a big component. Uh, Anonymous asks, how will small scale package systems be regulated? Will individual households be issued permits and sample to ensure compliance? Many of the phosphorus medias you showed are organic frameworks using aluminium and conventional dosing uses. Iron uses iron and there mm. is appreciable levels of contaminants from heavy metals would wide-scale application of these methods just be exchanging a nutrient issue for metals pollution instead which is not what we would want clearly um, another unintended consequence um, i don't think i'm able to comment on that really other than um i think the, we've got to guard against it yeah yeah, absolutely. And the point of approval, I think, you know, they Natural England will want to see a, a, a specification for the system to show how, how much phosphorus it can be removed. Um, I don't know whether they'll be monitoring and sampling that. Uh, Helena asks, can NNP be removed from uh, wastewater treatment works, be used as raw material for fertilizer production at the moment instead of imported material? We've kind of answered that. We have, we just touched on that, and it is it is used as a, as a soil conditioner and, and fertilizer. But Very that good. also brings its own metals issues and other, other issues, plastics. And... Is reducing the impermeable area related to future land use? Surely this stage also involves pet feces and fertilizer use. Yeah, so the nutrient loads that are uh, specified take into account um you know nitrogen and phosphorus from pet feces and urine um and also garden uses of fertilizer etc so the the, the impermeable area um is just for the sort of the residential block of land not the the open space or anything else um where you know it's it's 50 percent hard standing essentially and 50 percent gardens and road verges so that is taken into account okay Anonymous asks, please, can you provide the link to the package plant study conducted by Natural England? Yeah, I think that's there. I right. think that was in the presentation, wasn't it? Um, and yes, I think it was. Yep. If not, we can answer that subsequently. Okie dokie. Uh, Anonymous asks, Syria guidance, how do you know what area of suds the percentage removal rates require? What area of suds? Um, the suds need to be designed for the volume of runoff that you are going to generate from the site. Um, typically, that's based on a, a one in a hundred plus whatever climate changes for that particular region uh, of the UK, uh, and that then drives the um, the sizing. Essentially, I'm not a suds engineer, but we could we could certainly get some more info if you needed to. Yeah, and that's that's covered a lot in the SUDS manual. Cheers. Yeah. Clean linkage with environmental land management objectives. Elms. Hi, James, says Stuart. <laughs> Hi, Stuart. Um, thanks for an interesting question. Uh, I don't quite know what you're getting at there. Um, but certainly, yes, I think I think you're right. Elms, um, BNG, it's all coming together. And I think what we're it looking is. at internally is you know, this integrated water management approach for developments where you've got um, a water efficiency issue, you've got, um, you know, a, a grey water recycling, um, you've got flood risk, uh, you've got nutrient neutrality, BNG, and it's, it's about how do you make it more clever, you know, rainwater yeah. harvesting, green roofs, we've got to be able to put it all together into a package really that uh, resolves multiple issues. Yeah, like it. Will the recording be on the Cyberman website on YouTube? Hopefully, yes. Um, what has been your experience with the Environment Agency on permitting wastewater treatment uh, works and PTP, as they often ask for a connection if there is an existing public water treatment works and will not permit these? Yes. Uh, 
interesting question. We are finding that it's possible, um, but clearly you need to get to uh, a discharge location, which is one of the main constraints. You know, do you have a sufficiently sized water course to discharge to within a reasonable distance? Otherwise, you're building a big pipeline. Um, when you have an on-site wastewater treatment works, and it's it's either through a NAV company like Seven Frank Connect, or there are others, they will be off what approved, so they will have all of the permitted development rights of uh, of a local water company. So, you know, they can manage all of that. The Environment Agency, I think, is is being quite um, challenging, um, but it is certainly permissible. Uh, permissible. Okay. Uh, Lorraine asks, what is the general phosphorus load from an individual? Oh, it's got a three and a five in it. Um, I can't remember. I can answer that afterwards. Um, there's there's a load that the Pool Harbour uses. I think it's 0.35 or 0.0035 kilograms a day, something like that. Okay. Sarah asks, as regards citing any wetland or NBS, how can we be sure the right NBS is installed in the right place, i.e. involving catchment partnerships, catchment plans, etc.? Concerned that NN play payments may end up with mitigation being the wrong type and in the wrong place. Sorry about the abbreviations, but I'm not, I'm not party to them. Right, so NBS, nat uh, nature-based solutions. So, you. you know, wetland would be that. Um, and then nutrient neutrality, got it. Nutrient now. neutrality, yeah. So, I mean, I think there are catchment partnerships that are operating these. I know that the, I think it's the Norfolk Rivers Trust or Norfolk Wildlife Trust has developed a series of integrated constructed wetlands for Anglian water to polish their treated effluent. Um, the scheme in the Tees catchment is and the mitigation scheme there land conversion is delivered i understand uh, on behalf of natural england by um you know a catchment partnership and the trusts uh, wildlife trust and things so you know I, I think you're right to be concerned um you know particularly if a developer does it on their own i suspect um but where there's a mitigation scheme, I think that's all been quite carefully addressed. But it does, it still does use agricultural land um, that we could use for growing food. Yeah, absolutely. Certainly, um, we had a recent uh, uh, webinar in the Southwest region, Upstream Thinking, which was uh, based in Cornwall, which, you know, showed that there was connected uh, thinking uh, for, for, for a lot of the catchments down there. Um, good. Okay. Uh, Robert asked, the Environment Agency has a preference for connecting to the main sewerage network. How does the promotion of private on-site sewage treatment works fit in with this preference? I think we just answered that, haven't we? Um, I think we probably so, have. Yeah, I think it's possible, definitely. Okie dokie. Uh, green roofs were mentioned as a possible mitigation measure. How would green roofs manage nutrients? Would these just be for surface water runoff on the roof? Yeah, so roof runoff is generally pretty clean, um, you know, in terms of nutrients, there will be some that drops down in the rain, um, and then there's, you know, bird uh, VCs on, on the roof itself, but it's generally one of the cleaner portions of the surface water runoff, but green roofs, yes, would just be um, dealing with that surface water runoff and managing that at source rather than putting it into the system, and then you need an oversized system to, to deal with the water volume. It, uh, yep, Robert asks, it's difficult enough to monitor the existing number of wastewater treatment works for compliance when there are few large companies. So who will pay for monitoring compliance of many smaller works operated by many smaller new companies? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, and I, I don't know. Um, presumably, there's still be a compliance monitoring requirement that um, will fall to somebody, um, whether that's the EA or whether it's it's done by the actual operators. I don't know. Interesting. Mm. Sarah asks, OK, if point of impact is where the pipe enters a water body, why not install treatment works or na nature based solutions downstream to catch nutrients rather than upstream, which will not affect the effluent coming from the pipe? Or have I misunderstood? Right, I probably just haven't been clear enough. Um, so if you have a river 
and it is designated as a special area of conservation. And your site is upstream of that SAC boundary and you discharge into a wastewater treatment works. And then it flows down into that SAC. You could mitigate that at any point between, well, any point upstream of that SAC boundary. So you could mitigate it between your discharge point and the SAC boundary, or you could mitigate upstream because you're still taking out equivalent amount of nutrients that you're putting in, um, if you see what I mean. From the so, catchment. Yeah, yeah, from the catchment. Um, but if, yes, I think that's, I hope that's clear. It's good to me. Um, Anonymous asks, what would be your mitigation recommendations for a 40 plot residential development in the Derwent and Bassenthwaite Lake catchment in the Lake District? That's a really interesting question um, because it's at the smaller end of the scheme. And so, you know, the larger mitigation solutions that we use just wouldn't be cost effective and the viability would be. There's uh, certainly a lot of work going on in the Lake District, particularly on Windermere where they've got mm -hmm. issues. It's, it's, it's a very big problem. So It is uh, a big problem. Developing. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, you'll need the best on-site wastewater treatment works, potentially, if you can get a package treatment works that beats the local uh, wastewater treatment works if that's possible um, and then you know you're probably talking off-site mitigation really if you've got some land nearby um, or, or a commercial mitigation scheme very tricky happy to talk about it though um, it's getting getting on. evidence getting 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 the right evidence together you know data yeah. data collection is actually quite critical in these uh, types of things isn't it cool okay last question from Ruth any comment on managing and monitoring a wetland that receives flood water that might dilute or wash out sediment or capture of nutrients? Yeah, so that is a risk. Um, if you've got a wetland and you know you've captured nutrients for, for a number of years and you get a big flood that scours it out. So the wetland does need to be, um, I guess, designed either so it's just outside of the flood zone or that it is resilient to a flooding uh, event of some sort so it's clever design really I think optimal location um, and yeah I think that's what I can say at the moment on that. Great we've got uh, one one final question that's come in and uh, so this is the 34th question it's clearly uh, a really interesting topic uh, James Naden is the suds removal percentage just taken off the total as a percentage and not a removal rate per hectare it is taken off the surface water flow phosphorus or nitrogen load as a percentage that's how we've done that um, but that comes after you've done your calculations, you've added the 20% precautionary buffer, and only then can you take the suds off as mitigation. Um, Natural England won't accept that step before the 20% buffer is added. So, um, yeah. Wow. That's all the questions that we certainly have. I mean, um, I don't know, uh, Barbara, if you want me to summarize, uh, but a really enthralling uh, presentation from both Aidan and James, and you've handled the question so so uh, succinctly. Clearly um, a very important issue, uh, but thank you from, from my, my perspective. Barbara, over to you. I think I'd just like to thank the Southwest Branch for arranging this, and also to James and Aidan for a really interesting talk. Um, I think, it's a very topical uh, subject at the moment with nuclear vitality, and I think it's you know, understanding the solution. So we can, we can identify the problem, but also being positive and finding the solutions to those problems um, so that we can all go forward. So thank you very much. And thank you for everybody who's attended this evening as well. It's, um, I hope you've enjoyed the, uh, the webinar as much as I have. So, so thanks again.